Good afternoon and welcome to this afternoon's webinar. My name is Amber McGoldrick and I am the data admin here at Catalyst Connection. Today, Catalyst Connection is partnering with the Miller-Hyman Group to discuss how to identify performance gaps and implement world-class sales practices. If you don't already know, Catalyst Connection is a private, not-for-profit organization that provides consulting and training services to small manufacturers in southwestern Pennsylvania. Catalyst Connection has a variety of grant opportunities for manufacturers to take part in. Feel free to reach out to Erica Frischman or Matt Holgis for more information. Our presenter today will be Char Charlie Salaya, Business Development Manager of Miller Hyman Group. Charlie combines 20 years of experience in sales and service consulting with the world's largest sales performance improvement company. Thank you for being here today with us, Charlie. Amber, thank you so much for that warm welcome and hello everybody. I am indeed uh, Charlie Salaya with the Miller Hyman Group. And today we're going to discuss a really interesting study around world-class sales practices from CSO Insights. You may have heard of CSO Insights in the past. Uh, it's the independent research arm of Miller Hyman Group, was also formerly known as Chief Selling Officer Insights. So we should be seeing on our screen there a escalator that's coming down. And I want you to take a minute and imagine that you stand at the bottom of the down escalator. Have you ever tried to go running up an escalator that is coming down? I have, and I can tell you that if you haven't had that experience, it's worth it to try at least once. It's pretty hard to do. You got to constantly keep moving, and that's just to stay in one spot. I mean, if you really want to move forward, it takes extra effort. It's something that you really want. If you really want to do it, you really, really have to work at it. If you stop moving even for a few seconds, you'll find yourself back at the bottom. And if you pause for a moment, any progress you've made is wiped out. You're either going to be moving forward or you're going to be moving backward. Now let's think of this in terms of organizations and specifically sales organizations. Imagine if you pause for a moment, like a month or even a quarter. Will this approach take you up or down regarding the sales performance and productivity? Of course, that's going to take us down. So if we're not looking at improving our approaches every day, if we're not looking at innovating our practices that need a major redesign, like for example, how to sell practices, if we're not tackling all these topics, that's going to bring your sales organization's performance down. So with a sales organization, the mindset is we're always in a situation that we are running up to down escalator. Ideally, we should run faster and with a much better technique than our competitors. And we should begin right sooner rather than later. This next data point is going to illustrate more of what I mean. So one of the things about CSO Insights is as an organization, we're monitoring quota attainment along with other key performance indicators for many years. This study has actually now gone back over 13 years worth of data. And especially for quota attainment, there's a strong trend and that goes down, down the escalator. I mean, look over at 2011 at the 63% there and, and 2012. And then the 53% from 2017. That year's 53% uh, is the lowest value that we've ever measured for quota attainment. Uh, the 2018 numbers are being compiled, and interestingly enough, there'll be a report later this year regarding that. If we're looking at, in today's sales organizations, you really got to start running up this quota and attainment down escalator. But besides all that, there are still what we term world-class performers. And what are they doing? They're already running up the down escalator faster and better than others. And they really do succeed in doing so. Typically, they achieve a quota attainment above 60%. So we went back and said, well, what could we learn from them? And this question is always guiding the studies at CSO Insights. So I'm pleased today to share the findings from our world-class sales practices report. We're going to be reviewing that in the sales relationship matrix, which we term the SRP matrix. And this is a framework for evaluating relationship management and sale process implementation. 
I'm also going to share 12 practices that have been found to be the most highly correlated to sales performance. And then we're going to discuss how some organizations manage to implement these practices to achieve greater results. Finally, we'll, we'll provide some best practices and guidance with the goal to start a discussion on how you can apply these findings to your own organization. So in a fluid, rapidly changing, twisting and turning business environment, sometimes it's newsworthy when the research revalidates an existing tool, a method, or a model. And that really brings us to the sales relationship process matrix. One dimension represents the four different sales processes maturity levels. And that's from random, informal, formal, to dynamic. The second dimension, which is on the, on the bottom part, represents five different levels of customer relationship that an organization can achieve. And that's looking at from approved vendor, preferred supplier, solutions consultant, strategic contender, contributor to trusted partner. So we look at in the terms of a combination of your current process maturity, that random, informal, formal, and dynamic, and the customer relationship level, that's going to determine your performance level, which we're going to see in a minute. And here we are. These are the latest compiled results. Now we have here a little over a decade's worth of data and it, reminds, it remains both consistent and compelling. Moving over on up, so if you want your eyes to go from, from the bottom left to the top right, when you move over on up like that, the matrix improves performance against these key metrics. So the performance levels are defined based on a few things. One is revenue plan attainment, another is quota attainment, uh, win rates, loss rates, uh, no decisions, as well as turnover, both voluntary and involuntary. So looking at that red, 24.8 are in performance level one. In the yellow, we have level two at 48.4% and 26.8% in level three. Now, some organizations, they move up from level one to two, while others, when we looked at the data from uh, the year before rode the escalator down from three to two. What, what does this really mean? It really means that it only reinforces the point that there's really nothing static in today's business environment. There's no guarantees that you're going to stay at any one level once you've attained it. Think of that escalator. So you can look at this and find patterns that continue to hold true. Like for example, in performance level one, it's not a sustainable position. What I mean by that is even if you are successful as a small organization right now, and you have what you would think, hey, it's a, it's a random or informal process environment, it's not a scalable approach, not at all. You really can't grow an organization based on randomness. And when we're talking about sales, especially the buying decisions, those aren't in our control, but our process environment is entirely in our control. So when we're talking about revenue plan attainment, quota attainment, and win rates, those are the three KPIs that are going up from level one to level three. On the other side, loss rates and turnover rates are going down from level one to level three. Take a moment and look at that revenue plan attainment. The actual improvement from level one to level three is 5.7%. For quota attainment, the improvement is 27.7%. And for win rates for forecast deals, the actual improvement is 29%. Now think of this in terms of your own business and imagine what a win rate of 29.5% would mean if your current win rate is below that. Often, in terms of just one percentage point, that could really make or break your numbers. We're looking at the top 12 practices, relationship and process. So the first step was to take all the more than 60 practices that we have surveyed. 
what we did is we mapped all these practices against all the SRP metrics that we just talked about. And what we wanted to know was, you know, how many of these metrics are really impacted by each individual practice? In, the, in, our, in our terms, just, you know, how significant statistically would the results be? That's how we came up with this year's top 12 practices. The top 12 practices that showed the highest correlation significance score. And what that really means is each single practice impacts between five and seven performance metrics. That's a lot. That's what we call statistically significant. And these are the 12 practices in a nutshell. Now what these practices showed is that the strongest correlation to sales success. Six of these are linked to building better relationships along the vertical axis of the SRP. Those are the ones that you see in the blue R in the rightmost, in the rightmost column. Then the six that are linked to process maturity along the horizontal axis, that's the dark blue P. Here we can see how the practices line up against the SRP. Keep in mind that the relationship between process and relationship, process practices drive productivity and scalability. These are necessary in order to consistently succeed at relationship practices. We're doing a little bit of a deep dive here. We're gonna focus on practice number one. So the most strongly aligned practice was the following. Our salespeople, they consistently and effectively articulate a solution that is aligned to our customers' needs. While certainly this is not new, you could argue that the more sophisticated customers become, the higher their expectations become for alignment. What this really means is as a salesperson, you must configure and describe a solution in terms that clearly link to an expressed and specific need from your customer. So how do we do this? To do this, it requires process work. An example of this is knowing when is it appropriate to move to solution. It also requires skill mastery, you know, being able to articulate the solution in meaningful terms. But more importantly, we really must link to a customer journey framework as the anchor. So finally, since product and solution knowledge is becoming the norm for customers, as a seller, you must add perspective as part of the solution in order to stand out and create value for your customers. The second practice was, hey, we deliver a consistent customer experience, which lives up to and aligns with our brand promise. This is one of two practices which looks at customer relationship beyond just the elements which are driven by the sales force. So the customer experience, it really starts with the first brand impressions and carries forward throughout the entire relationship. So when we look at ensuring that this experience is consistent, and aligns with our brand promise, we have to look at marketing, sales, and service functions, and they really have to be tightly and formally integrated. The third practice is we continually assess why our top performers are successful. So if you ask a top seller why they are successful, typically they don't, they don't really know. It really requires a look from the outside Usually that's through some sort of assessment. And that's to get that understanding of what separates a top performer. You know, what natural tendencies does a top performer have that they do which work really well in your culture? You know, what skills and behaviors do they demonstrate? You know, what processes are they using? How do they do things? You know, with their success decoded, you can then modify your hiring criteria and you can look at incorporating those success profiles into hiring assessments and look at enablement strategies for replicating success among your existing teams. So as you can see, talent was another strong theme. 
The fourth practice was, well, when we lose a salesperson, we consistently determine the reasons why. And the interesting thing here is attrition continues to fall in recent years, but it's still an expensive thing when it happens. Attrition leads to recruiting, which leads to hiring and development expense. It also can put your client relationships at risk. So the best thing to do is to have formal exit interviews, manager interviews, et cetera, you know, to determine the root causes of attrition and then use those findings to change your hiring profiles, you know, coaching practices and enablement work. You know, attrition isn't always the wrong decision, you know, but working to minimize it and ensuring it happens quickly can be a huge cost saver. And the best, they learn from each other. So the fifth practice is we effectively collect and share best practices across our sales and service organizations. Sales managers must take the lead and sometimes this can involve the need to overcome internal competitiveness. Yeah, this does sound simple, but to be optimally effective, it needs to be enterprise wide and systematic, not just something that happens organically at internal sales meetings. Making it formal is something that ops and enablement can help with. So in addition, technology helps eliminate barriers to sharing. The easier you make it for a seller, guess what? The more likely it'll get done. Practice six is that sales managers are held accountable for the effective use of sales tools and resources by the sales force. One of the things that I've seen in, in, in over my, my 20 years of supporting clients is we really do ask a lot of sales managers and often they don't have too much support. So the issue is really in that organization, what are we holding them accountable for? You know, there's that old saying, what gets inspected gets expected and that applies here. So for example, what's built into commission plans? What's built into that job description? What is succession planning criteria? The key to this, the, the, the true key to this, of course, is coaching. So driving compliance, for example, to the use of CRM or sales enablement tools, that's just a surface level of accountability. The more important piece is the aligned coaching, which truly drives behaviors. In such coaching, it's gotta be formal and managers must be held accountable for it. And practice seven is about value messaging. And this is an increasingly hot topic in our marketplace. Specifically, our salespeople consistently and effectively communicate appropriate value messages that are aligned to our customers and prospects needs. Too often what happens within organizations is that they train the sellers on generic value propositions, which they're intended to just kind of like that one size fits all, you apply it broadly. Now, a value prop like that can help with marketing to broad segments, but value messaging and selling conversations has to be tailored to specific buyer roles and phases of that particular prospect or customer's journey. We shouldn't leave value messaging up to our sellers to craft randomly. It needs to be trained, it needs to be practiced and coached as a formal discipline. Practice eight is that our culture supports continuous development of salespeople and sales leaders. As Jerry Drucker says, culture, it eats strategy for lunch. If your culture doesn't support continuous learning, doesn't support collaboration and development, then guess what? It just won't happen. You know, consider your sales organization. Is development for new hires only? For those with performance issues? Do managers make time for it? Is there a demonstrated commitment? So continuous learning is a priority and a certification requirement for many professions like accounting, medicine. We feel very strongly it should be a priority for selling as a profession too. Again, back to talent. Practice nine is as part of our performance review process, our organization consistently develops and ensures implementation of personalized performance improvement plans. Well, let's differentiate something here, clarify something, kind of trips people up sometimes. 
coaching is not the same as performance management. You know, performance management is a periodic, regular process, and it involves clarifying performance expectations. It involves evaluating performance using both our leading and our lagging indicators, and also creating personalized development plans for improvement. I mean, this is more than just a check the box exercise for human resources. It's more than just filling out a form. And it's more than just seeing if someone is meeting quota. Practice 10 reflects another trend becoming more and more important to sales. And what's that? Customers have consistently positive interactions with us, regardless of which channels they use to work with us. So think about this. In most organizations, a client relationship, it's going to involve many different touch points. You have inside sales, you have direct sales, you have distributors, you have customer success, customer service, whether that's live, whether that's through chat or email, you may have alliance partners, uh, heck, even accounting, and more can take the lead on a particular interaction. So the key is that each should feel like they are part of the same relationships and each should meet or exceed expectations. From the customer's perspective, does it feel like they're working with one organization or does it feel like they're working with 10? A real helpful suggestion here is to take particular notice of high value interactions. When do customers form their most critical impressions? Again, a common theme. Learn from the past and apply the lessons to the future. So practice 11 is our sales teams are effective at surfacing the specific reasons why a client stops doing business from us, with us, excuse me. So this information can come from the sellers themselves as you know, they're often typically the closest to the relationship, but even so that information can be skewed by interpersonal relationships or limited by who the seller knows. The best what they usually do is leverage third parties who can conduct live interviews with clients. That way you get more candid and usable feedback. One final practice is that we are effective at selling value to avoid discounting or gaining comparative value in return for price concessions. So the key here to avoiding discounting is to start selling value before you get into the negotiations phase of the sales process. Our numbers show that those who sell value early and often are less likely to offer concessions at the end of the sales cycle. Negotiations, they shouldn't feel like a different process, like a win-lose than the sales process, which was conducted as a win-win. If it does feel different, they consider whether your team has been properly skilled to overcome price objections with selling skills prior to negotiations. So now we're going to take a look at what we can learn from the very best performers. It's pretty easy to identify world-class sports teams. You know, they're the ones that win the world championships. Some teams, they're able to do it year after year. You know, and, that, and that's despite the fact that players retire or they don't make the cut and new rookies have got to be recruited and put in to take their place. You know, and while having talented athletes is important, what makes the teams world class is what they're willing to do to get there. So to turn in a world class performance on game day, athletes, they focus on training activities that have a significant impact on their performance. Everything else is a waste of time. But that doesn't mean that they focus exclusively on those areas that relate directly to their position. For example, every world-class football player knows that the time they spend in the weight room building muscle mass, that's just as important as the time they spend on the field. You know, coaches, they're behind them every step of the way. There's a whole ton of analytics, you know, based on research into training regimens and nutrition that leads to results. You know, they track. They measure, they analyze the athlete's performance to make sure that the training is paying off. You know, they make sure that their athletes don't waste time on random acts of training, right? So like the professional athlete, sales professionals don't have time to waste on random activities either. 
To be world class, that means accepting that performance is going to be tracked, measured, and analyzed. And sometimes it's in an uncomfortable amount of detail. You know, sales coaches, they use this data to make sure that their people, even the newest recruits, are performing the activities and exhibiting the behaviors that lead to success. Sales organizations that become world class at using research and incorporating analytics, they really improve that day-to-day -day performance and they're the ones that meet their targets year after year. So earlier we discussed how we identified the world-class practices. And we did that by determining how many and how strongly they impacted the sales results. Then we identified all study participants who reported to execute at least 10 of the 12 practices collectively and consistently. That means that they reported a six or seven on the seven point scale. As you might expect, you know, this is a small portion of the overall survey population, 6.9%. It's not easy to be world class. And finally, what we did is validate that these world class performers were indeed more successful than others. You know, even SRP level three performers were taken as a whole. You can see on the left hand side that the world class segment is 6.9 of the overall study population. And on the right side, you see the results between world class and all respondents. Also, here you can take a look and see that the world class segment outperforms all respondents. You know, there's a quite a significant amount there. Look specifically at the differences regarding revenue attainment, uh, quota attainment, and win rates for the forecast deals. Those improvements are two digit. You know, consider, take a moment and consider what that math would mean within your organization. Each member of the world class group is represented as a purple dot on this matrix. As you expect, there's going to be more world class performers as, as an organization travels to the upper right side of the matrix. But if you look at this closely, you also see that world-class performers exist at each level. World-class doesn't look the same for everyone. The takeaway is that business context has a really strong influence on world-class. So let's take a look at two examples. We'll start with that small consultancy. So let's just say that there's a few consultants with to have some sales responsibility they have high value messaging skills, strategically relevant services. They are using a, a random informal process, um, but they're up in that level of that contributor or trusted partner. On the other side, we have a larger organization selling commodities. You know, products or services, you know, they're, they're not of any strategic relevance to the buyer. It's highly commoditized and it's transactional selling environments. In this case, they're using a formal or dynamic process, but they're seen typically as preferred suppliers by their customers. So the difference is that small consultancy approach, it's successful right now, but that is not scalable at all. Think about this for a second. Imagine if those five or 10 salespeople, you know, become 15 or 20, and then imagine that each one of them is doing things differently. That's a real dangerous situation that will put the whole company at risk. Now, our large, our large organization there on the right, they've invested in a mature process landscape. Again, they're in that formal or dynamic process. They have an organized sales system that has a scalable approach. So if you imagine that they enrich their product portfolio with more strategic services, they can do that. Or they can grow into such a new model and become a solutions consultant. They already have the building box, the prerequisites already in place to do so. Again, look at it, they're scalable, not scalable. Now let's take a moment and look at how we can apply these findings to your own organization. Looking at the sales relationship process matrix, you should have all received a link 
when you signed up for the webinar that will let you take this SRP matrix exercise as a participant and have a report. If you haven't done it, that's okay. You can do it um, af after the call, uh, have a Q and A with, with your Catalyst Connection uh, contact as well. What we'll do is you can establish a starting point, right? You've got to look at how you plot your sales organization on the SRP matrix. Basically, where are you today? So it, taking that exercise, it's going to ask you a few questions. It typically takes about five to 10 minutes to complete. It's going to take a look at your organization overall. Now, there's going to be outliers in both directions, but you need to decide what the norm is in the organization, not the exception. So answering those questions will help you to do that. When you evaluate your placement on the relationship access, what we're doing is remember, we're looking at it on putting yourself in your customer shoes. How do your customers see you? Not how do you see yourself or your organization, how you would like to be seen. Think of it in that frame, in the lens of your customer. Then you gotta take a look at agreeing on a realistic goal. Typically, this is a 12 to 18 months time frame. Now, when you're looking at that goal, you ask yourself where you need to be established a position of competitive strength. You know, what can you realistically achieve in the next 12 to 18 months? It's really rare, and I've seen a lot of data on this, it's very rare for an organization to move more than one performance level at a time. The, the, best, the best formula for success here is to aim for progress within a performance level to move from one over to the next. You know, it may not be possible for your organization to move to the next level. If you're constrained by a business model factor, you know, that's going to put a limit on your movement along that, like the relationship access, right? However, you can still strive for movement towards the upper right by focusing on the process. Remember what we talked about, the buying decision, not in your control, but that process definitely is. Completing that exercise is going to help you benchmark your organization against the world-class practices. You know, consider that the 12 world-class practices, you know, those are the ones that are linked to the greatest levels of success. So, hey, doing this will say, well, how successfully and consistently has my organization mastered these practices? You know, be sure to consider that your context as you're thinking about implementing these practices. There really isn't a universal approach per se. You know, there's no quote unquote right answer as to how many you should attempt to implement at once. But if you do one or two well, it's going to really outdistance doing several of them sporadically. Here we're looking at that world-class versus all, and these are the relationship practices. Here's where we focus on the, pro the benchmark against the top 12 practices for process. Here is specifically from all our responses on, on the last level of the, uh, the SRP matrix from all the, all of the filling out. This is specifically within the world of manufacturing. So there's a few things here from an opportunity perspective. I highlighted there, you'll notice the ones in, in blue and yellow, that's uh, relationship versus process. So looking at our salespeople consistently and effectively communicate appropriate value messages that those messages are aligned to our customers and prospects needs. From a world-class perspective, 97% of responders are, are, are in that level. All responses from regardless of industry, 43, manufacturing, 32. From looking at how we manage opportunities, how our salespeople consistently and effectively articulate a solution that's aligned to our customers' needs. That's the key word there, aligned to the customers' needs. What do world-class performers do? 91% do that. 45 responses in general from the manufacturing space, 37%. So as salespeople, are we effective at selling value in order to look at avoiding that discounting? 
or gaining comparative value in return for those price concessions. World class, 75%. All responses, 24. Manufacturing, 11. Some further insight into this. We're looking at our sales teams, at their effectiveness, at surfacing the specific reasons why a customer stops doing business with us. It's a hard conversation to have. World class, 69% do that. All responses, roughly a third, 31%. Manufacturing, 32%. When we deliver a consistent customer experience, that customer experience lives up to and aligns with our brand promise. You know, we, we, we mean what we say, we, we walk the walk, right? World class, 89%. All responses, 36, manufacturing, 29%. For the customers that have consistently positive interactions with us, it doesn't matter what channel they're using. Regardless of what the channel is when they work with us, it's a consistently positive interaction. World-class organizations, 82%. All responses, 31, manufacturing, 23. From the perspective of people and organization, when we lose a salesperson, we've talked about this, the voluntary or involuntary, we look at it consistently determining the reasons why. World-class organizations, 95% of them do that. General response is 42, manufacturing 42. And as part of that performance review process, our organization is constantly, we're constantly fighting up against that down escalator, right? We're continually developing and ensuring implementation of personalized performance improvement plans. The key there is personalized. That's 87% world class, 40 in general, 39 manufacturing. You know, we also look as an organization why our top performers are successful. We assess that. 94% world class do, 38 for respondents, 22 for manufacturing. Effectively collecting and sharing best practices across our sales and service organizations. That's 84%. 30% within all responses, 19% within manufacturing. And then our culture supporting continuous development of salespeople and sales leaders, 89% in world-class, 37% responses, 36% within manufacturing. And finally within this, that our sales managers are held accountable for the effective use of tools involving sales and resources by the sales force. Within those world-class organizations, that's a really high number, 87%, general population 42, manufacturing 38. So let's take a look for a moment at building out a systemic action plan. I love this visual. I'm a visual guy. I think that this kind of sticks in, in, in my head, and, and it's really helped out my clients as well. So when you look at plotting a course for your organization, you want to continue consider the practices that, that I've been talking to you about in the context of a sales system, right? This allows you to assemble an integrated set of initiatives versus a piecemeal approach. In the middle, we have a customer. Everything goes around and circulates as an organization around our customer. Around that customer, we look at that green arrow is creating opportunities. You know, do our salespeople, when they communicate, are they given the consistency and effectiveness of those appropriate value messages? And here's the key again, these value messages, they're aligned to our customers and our prospects needs. When we've identified an opportunity, are salespeople consistently and effectively articulating a solution that's aligned, again, to those customers' needs. You know, are we effective as a sales group at selling value? That way we avoid discounting or at gaining comparative value in return for price concessions. And then on that managing relationships arrow, you know, customers that consistently positive interactions with us, regardless of what channel they're using to work with us. You know, do we as an organization deliver a consistent customer experience that it lives up to and aligns with our brand promise and our sales teams effective at figuring out those reasons why our customers, they're gonna stop doing business with us. Are we effective at getting those reasons out? There's another layer that encapsulates those we just talked about and that's the sales operations and sales enablement. 
what 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 do we see from this as a practice that impacts the business management? You know, there are consistent continual assessments. We know why our top performers are successful. We continually assess that practice. We look at effectively collecting and sharing those best practices and then using that a, across the sales and service organizations. And one point about a service organization, a lot of times organizations, companies, they have such a relentless focus on bringing in new business. They realize that the cost of bringing in new business is seven times higher than keeping the existing customer that you have. There's many times where I've had conversations with the chief sales officer at an organization or a chief revenue officer. And when we do the numbers, you can't sell yourself out of a leaky bucket. If, you, if you're bringing in new clients in the top of the bucket and you're leaking out seven times at the bottom, uh, that's, not a, that's not a sustainable approach. So we look at, remember that in a service organization, when the customer comes in, typically whoever's in, whoever department is in charge of servicing that, that customer, they're going to talk to that customer quite a bit, in many cases, much, much more than the sales professional will. So it's extremely important that those, uh, those uh, best practices are aligned across the organization. And the way we do that is the culture within the organization is a supporting continuous development of the salespeople and the sales leaders. You know, again, looking at that from that people and organization, we, we get an understanding for you know, why we lose salespeople, both voluntary and involuntary. And as part of our review process, you know, we're continually developing. We're continually implementing. We're looking at that personalized approach to those improvement plans. So as you're thinking about and looking at from that management execution perspective, you know, are we holding the managers accountable for the effective use of that? You know, you look at your own specific plan and consider looking at that action plan. Consider that entire sales system. You know, how well do we function with each component? You know, how well do the components align with each other? You know, consider both the necessary and differentiating practices within each of these functions. You know, you prioritize areas where you're well behind the curve, areas where alignment is needed and those areas that are differentiating. And what you're going to find is that some of these practices are so significant and encompassing that they're going to be tough to change in the near term. So if you do find that, then you look at how you might break them down into smaller milestones. That's where we got into that, that 12 to 18 month planning horizon, right? You want to help create that roadmap for your initiatives. Um, you know, one of the things that happens to that is due to market factors and some uncontrollable variables, you know, you'll probably have to make some pretty substantial changes to your plan annually, if not more frequently. So as I mentioned, everybody on the webinar today, um, you'll get a, a follow-up. It'll also include that link. Um, the link is going to allow you to do the sales relationship process matrix exercise. When you complete that exercise, you will have a report that is generated immediately. It's a PDF report. It's going to be sent to your email. And then one of your Catalyst Connection contacts will get that report as well. And it will really help you have that initial conversation on where do we start? Where is the starting point here? So as we're talking about that, that starting point, um, I'll just leave it here, uh, Amber, and uh, ask for any, any questions that we have. Sure. Hi, this is uh, Matt Holches with Catalyst Connection. Um, I did want to let everybody know that there are some additional upcoming uh, trainings for uh, Miller-Hyman in the coming weeks. Uh, there will be information coming your way. Check your calendar of events or our calendar of events for some of those training programs. Uh, there was uh, a couple questions that came in. Uh, I'll just throw me away, Charlie. Uh, okay. The first one is how does an organization move up on the relational side of the matrix? Matt, thank you for that. Yeah, so great question. So when, again, when we're talking on the relational side, we're talking about how our customers and prospects view us as salespeople. Are we a vendor? Um, are we someone that brings value to each and every interaction that we have with them, are we moving up to the level of, let's say, trusted advisor, right? That upper left quadrant within the matrix. So one of the things that I'm very passionate about, and I know that Catalyst Connection also does an excellent job in this, is a professional selling skills workshop. 
Now that specific workshop, I got a slide on it here. That specific workshop is really helping around those customer interaction skills. And you know, we're looking in, at, in, the, in the lens of that win-win relationship. As a, as a sales professional, when I speak to somebody for the first time and I'm trying to get an understanding of their needs, it's through effective questioning and listening and trying to find what is termed the need behind the need, listening to that language of needs of that prospect to be able to then shape with them what's going to be an appropriate next step. What I really love about professional selling skills is in addition to the, that workshop environment, um, everybody that goes through that also has a professional selling skills call planner. And think of a call planner as, a, as an excellent tool that both management and an individual sales professional can use um, to provide a framework for, hey, as I'm, as I'm planning for my upcoming meeting with, with my customer or prospect here, here are, the, here are the things that I want to address. It provides that framework that you can use within an organization to scale and go from that level of, of, of a vendor to eventually that level within that trusted advisor. Great question, thank you. Uh, any others? Yeah, here's a, another one. I think this is more related to uh, sales retention. I guess where you were talking about the it's seven times it costs seven times more to uh, find a new customer or get a new customer as opposed to keeping one. Um, what are some strategies to help create a culture of sales in your organization? So it's not just the salesperson, but it's the customer service and other people that are kind of maintaining those relationships often after a salesperson kind of hands it off or lets it go through the system. Yeah, yeah, that's an excellent, excellent question. That's so important, right? I mean, if, if we think about it in the world today and we think about, hey, if I'm walking up to my fridge and my fridge is connected to the Internet, it can see what what items are in there as far as the Internet of Things, knows my buying patterns. Um, I make an order from Amazon. I've got to drop off very quickly. It's here at my house. It's a very personal relationship. Um, in the world of business to business and the world of talking with our clients, you know, what, what happens when there's that disconnect, right? Um, if, if as a, as a individual person and I'm, and I'm working as, as an entity with the donor business, I'm willing to look at mistakes and say, okay, mistakes can happen, but do I feel that, um, valued? Do I feel that, um, they're making the efforts to make it right? Um, are the touch points that are, customer experience or customer service folks having consistent with the same type of experience that I had uh, up front with, let's just say with our, with our selling professionals. So one of the, one of the really interesting workshops and tools that we have that is, it's, it's called service ready and service ready also provides, uh, and I believe that uh, folks here also have access uh, through this through Catalyst Connection as well. Uh, service ready provides, um, a workshop that has five different components to it. Each of those components addresses a different challenge within that environment. And uh, you, can you can have an experience and complete one component of that uh, typically within a half a day. I believe that's about a three and a half uh, to four hour workshop. And again, it's more than just looking at these things as events. As, the, as that question indicated, it's looking at it from a holistic view of, we're gonna sustain this going forward within our organization. And I know that with my interactions with Catalyst Connection, the Catalyst Connection is an excellent partner to help on those sustainment best practices. Uh, once once uh, an initiative is started, uh, you look at um, how, to roll out the, how, how to roll out that initiative, how to sustain that initiative, and how to follow up with best practices. So um, excellent question. When you think about that, think about, hey, um, I have a resource here through Catalyst Connection and ask about service ready programs. They'll be able to provide more information about that. And this is another question. I think it may even be somewhat related, um, but is there an existing methodology to move from a random sales process to a dynamic sales process? Yeah, that's, that is a big challenge. Um, fortunately, there is quite a bit of not only uh, research on that, there is uh, some programs that most definitely can, can help identify that process. You have, to, you have to take your lens back a little bit when it's a random process 
and figure out through that assessment piece first. I mean, you know, have that assessment to understand what's working and what's not, uh, and then build a framework around that um, to, to push into the organization to get it from that random, uh, start moving it towards the informal and formal and dynamic. Now, uh, I'll give you an example, specifically within Miller Hyman Group, um, last year, we, we turned ourselves from uh, a dynamic process into a formal process. We went down the escalator a bit and, you know, we went back internally and said, well, we need some, some fresh ideas around sales enablement as an organization on what the market is dictating to us is working and what's not. So again, here's one uh, opportunity I would say for, for the individual that asked that question or for others that may be interested in this, um, happy to uh, connect with someone within Catalyst Connection to look at that holistic approach and look at specific plans and provide some options. The, the, the short answer is yes, we have a framework. Um, yes, it, it most definitely can be successful. And yes, that is definitely something within the wheelhouse and, and part of the relationship strength, I think, with uh, Catalyst Connection and Miller Hyman Group. Great, and then one last question it looks like. Uh, this is kind of a unique one, but uh, actually not too unique for the manufacturers that we work with, because it looks like they're asking, uh, what can you do when the sales team is actually not yours, uh, but actually uh, sales reps or uh, distributors that you sell through? I guess they want to know if there are any kind of things that you can be doing to kind of support that sales channel. Absolutely. So uh, it, we turn that internally as our channel enablers. So there, there definitely is a, a shift in, in how that relationship goes, obviously between an employed seller and somebody that is a, uh, a channel seller or, or, or a partner. Um, but again, we do have um, some uh, really strong current success stories around that um, with, with some clientele. Um, and I believe that that is also something that we can apply kind of the same thought process of, you know, partnering within Catalyst Connection, use your contact at Catalyst Connection to move forward that conversation um, and, and, and learn more about your specific needs and how we could help and help support you. Great. Well, Charlie, it was a great presentation today. Uh, everybody that's online watching this program, please uh, remember that there is going to be a link for you to uh, take that assessment. Um, you can also contact me at Catalyst Connection. My contact information will be on, is on this slide as well as Erica Frischman. We will also be sending a copy of this PowerPoint to all the attendees and making sure that it is also up on our website so you can download some of this information. I also wanted to let everybody know that uh, Miller Hyman is a partner of, through Catalyst Connection and as a training partner. Um, companies that want to leverage or choose to leverage this type of program can also possibly leverage WebNet funding to cover the costs around or um, cover some of the costs around uh, sales training. Uh, there's also an opportunity to potentially leverage what is the ARC or the PA Makes ARC Power Grant where companies can get up to $10,000 reimbursement for this type of training. Great. So thank you for joining us today. Uh, look forward to seeing you in the future. Thank you everybody for your time. All righty.